Hello, bonjour, and welcome to this France Revisited presentation about the American First World War Memorials, Monuments, and Cemeteries of France. I'm Gary Lee Kraut, the editor of France Revisited, and I'm honored that the American Battle of Monuments Commission, the ABMC, has accepted to participate in this presentation. In a few minutes, I'll be introducing you to my guest, Ben Brands, historian with the ABMC who is joining me today from Arlington, Virginia, while I'm speaking to you from my home in Paris. Before introducing Ben, however, I'd like to explain what incited me to want to develop this presentation and to seek out the ABMC's participation. As an editor, travel journalist, lecturer, travel advisor, and occasional guide for curious travelers, I'm particularly interested in helping people connect with a destination. In addition to the sheer enjoyment of travel and discovery abroad, we personally connect in different ways on our travels in France. We can connect as food lovers, as art lovers, as wine lovers, as people who like to go cycling, or as admirers of beautiful gardens or medieval architecture, even as doctors or lawyers or business leaders. Whatever our interest or pleasure or curiosity may be drawn to, we can connect with it. We can also connect as Americans. As Americans, we are inevitably drawn to the American Second World War sites of Normandy. I have no doubt that many of you have already been there. I'm referring specifically to the Normandy American Cemetery that overlooks Omaha Beach and Pointe du Oc, the heavily fortified cliff top that was famously assaulted by Americans on D-Day. Some of you might also have visited Utah Beach and the town of St. Mary Glise. When I give lectures in the United States or meet travelers in Paris, an extraordinarily high percentage will tell me that they've either been to or dream of one day visiting our war sites in Normandy. Those are beautiful, significant, informative sites, absolutely deserving attention. But there's something about Normandy that seems to suck up all of our patriotic energy as travelers in France, leaving little interest in other American war sites. It's as though having done the Normandy American Cemetery and Omaha Beach, we feel that we've learned enough about and paid sufficient homage to American war memories in, Fr in France of the 20th century. And then don't even consider examining others, even those, even those close to other places that we might visit. And that disturbs me. There's actually another major American cemetery of the Second World War in Normandy that gets far fewer visitors. It's called the Brittany American Cemetery, but it's technically in Normandy near Mont Saint Michel. The Rhone American Cemetery in Draguignan, which speaks of the Allied landing in Provence, also draws few American visitors. As to the American First World War memorials, monuments, and cemeteries, of Northern and Northeastern France, they're sadly empty, or at least undervisited. Last week in preparing for this presentation, I revisited the Suresnes American Cemetery. That's just five miles west of Paris. There's a video of it on the French Revisited YouTube channel. You can see the Eiffel Tower from the cemetery. It was a beautiful autumn afternoon and I was the only one there. How could it be so thoroughly ignored when there are so many Americans in Paris and so many are telling me that they'd like one day to visit our war sites in Normandy? Is it from lack of interest in First World War sites or because of lack of awareness that these exist? How then to explain the interest in these sites? How then to make travelers aware of them? enter the ABMC. Earlier this year, I can contacted the ABMC and John Wessels, the chief operating officer, was kind enough to meet with me. Here are the two of us masked by COVID regulations at the ABMC's Paris office. I asked John Wessels if the ABMC would be willing to join forces with me to explain to readers of France Revisited and those who might watch this in replay, the interest of visiting the American World War I sites of France. John readily agreed, and I thank him for that. 
Now, I've written many articles about touring American war sites in France, both of the Second World War and the First World War. You can find them on France Revisited. I've given lectures in the United States on the subject and personally taken numerous travelers to visit these sites. But war touring is just a part of my work, as readers of France Revisited well know. I'm a generalist. So I needed a true specialist to join me for today's presentation, a military historian and military veteran who could speak authoritatively about both the events that took place at the First World War sites we'll be examining and the creation and evolution of these memorials, monuments, and cemeteries. Thanks to John Wessels and to the ABMC's media and communications duo of Hélène Chauvin in Paris and Ashley Burns in Arlington, we found the perfect specialist for today's program. Ben Brands. Ben, welcome. Thank you. Uh, yes, so my name is Ben, and I'm a historian at the American Battle Monuments Commission. Uh, and, and kind of just to get up and start it off, uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission is a federal agency. We are part of the United States government, uh, funded by te your tax dollars. Uh, and our mission is to administer America's overseas military cemeteries and monuments. Um, we have 26 cemeteries and 32 monuments spread across, you know, 17 foreign countries and primarily World War I and World War II, but we have had our mission expanded over, over the years. And so we have sites that represent other wars as well. We have a cemetery in Mexico that includes burials as far back as the Mexican-American War from the 1840s. Uh, we have a, a two cemeteries in the Philippines, one World War II explicitly, and then one that, that covers multiple wars. Uh, and we even have a cemetery in Panama that dates to the building of the Panama Canal. Uh, so a, a wide and varied mission, but the, you know, the cemeteries and monuments for World War I and World War II have always been uh, kind of the heart of our agency's role. And um, that's mostly what we'll be talking about today, specifically the ones in France. Yourself, you were an infantry officer. Uh, you have taught military history at the um, at West Point and at Oregon State University. And then I've read that so that now you're getting a PhD in in at what at George Mason? Yes, at George Mason University, just down the road here in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. So uh, was your personal interest uh, history or military? I mean, you entered the military. What, uh, how did you come to become a historian and what does a historian at the BMC do? Yeah, so, you know, it's, I, I would say that my interest in history came first and specifically my interest in military history as, you know, as, even as a kid. Uh, I can remember we had to do a research project when I was in fifth grade and, and you know, lots of people did one on the Chicago Bulls or, or you know, surfing or whatever. And, and I did mine on the Battle of Gettysburg. So I came to it pretty early and, and through that kind of, you know, when I went to college, uh, did ROTC and went into the military, largely drawn uh, to the military from my, you know, interest in its history. I did a, a decade in the military and as part of that, you know, I was selected to go teach history at West Point. So the the Army actually paid to send me to grad school and get a master's and then go teach at West Point for two years. Uh, and then I've, I got out and I've uh, kept going with history. And so I, I continued on from master's to into the PhD program and I got hired at uh, ABMC in 2019. Um, and, and do you have a, uh, for your PhD, do you have a specific uh... Uh, era or approach or something? What what specific? Yeah, so my PhD actually looks at um, the late 19th century, early 20th century. So basically, from around the 1870s up through this outbreak of World War One, uh, looks at kind of the professionalization of the officer corps and specifically the, the development of officers' uh, professional military education uh, during that period. Hmm. Uh, well, that's the period when uh, Pershing is growing up. We'll eventually get to him. Uh, and uh, what does it? What do you? What does a historian with the AB, ABMC do? Yeah, other so than, other than have the pleasure of being with us, it's uh, you know definitely not what does a historian at ABMC do. What does the historian at ABMC do? I'm, uh, I'm the only one here. Uh, uh, so okay. we, have a, we have a director of historical services. Uh, but it's really my boss who's the, the director and then I'm the historian and then uh, we have a collections uh, who manages collections as well. Um, but so I have a pretty wide portfolio. I do 
some of our longer term projects, uh, such as our publications. We're working on a publication right now for our centennial, which will be next year. And I work on our education program where we partner with other organizations that have similar interests uh, to develop educational curriculum to tell the story of these wars and of the fallen to the American public. Because one of the things we deal with as an agency is that most of our sites are overseas, uh, but our main audience is the American public, many of whom will never get to our sites. Um, and so how do we bring these stories home? And so we've had educational partnerships with the World War II Museum, with National History Day, with the Smithsonian, uh, and we've worked with other partners, World War I Museum, uh, National Park Service, and so uh, I do that. I also, you know, have research support to the cemeteries if, if they are trying to research a soldier or, or an event and they kind of come up to the end of their skill set. Uh, they'll they'll call me and I will try and assist them with additional resources uh, and I also have a, a responsibility to answer questions to the public so we get a number of you know public inquiries from from average Americans who have questions that I then research and answer uh, and then I do you know a number of presentations such as this throughout the year I, I did one yesterday uh, with Smithsonian American Art Museum talking about the use of art in our cemeteries uh, and I've done them for other organizations as well since it's going to be on the screen for the next hour, can you tell us what's behind you? What's 52A? Oh, so that is uh, from when I was in the Army. That is my company guide on from when I was a company commander in Afghanistan. So it's Alpha Company 52nd Infantry Regiment uh, was the, the company I commanded, and that, that was part of uh, 2nd Infantry Division. And the the, uh, the sword, what are we seeing? What's the... Uh, the sword is there. That's actually a, uh, you know, it's a replica of a movie prop from the movie 300. Uh, and that's on there because, you know, in the military, you have call signs and it's usually, you know, your company has a call sign and then the number after the call sign designates your position within the company. And our call sign when I was a company commander was Spartan. So I was I was Spartan six. Uh, my XO was Spartan five uh, and so on down the chain. But because we had that as our call sign, we adopted that as kind of our, you know, identity. And so I've got a Spartan sword on my you know, striker infantry company guide on. Before returning to Ben for commentary on specific sites, I'd like to set the scene from a traveler's point of view by showing several maps. This, many of you will recognize, is a map of D-Day and the invasion of Normandy, 1944. I've no doubt that most of you who have visited the landing zone of Normandy know this map is when you visit Normandy, this and similar maps get imprinted on your mind as symbols themselves of strength and victory. It's an easy map to understand. You see the arrival across the channel to the five landing beaches, the push inland, the German counterattack in black, then the push forward in all directions. And when you're visiting Normandy, this map in mind, you can stand on the edge of the cemetery and look out to sea and think, I get it. This was the sacrifice for that clear, successful push inland. I'm a part of the nation or nations involved in that. There's a certain victor's pride in the map itself, which is one reason for the attraction of the Normandy landing zone as a destination. And as I said earlier, as the object of patriotism abroad. The World War I map is quite different. The map itself of 1914, in this case, involving French, British, and Belgian forces against German forces, is one of relative stalemate. In the nearly four years that follow, the front will waver slightly in one direction or another. But this is basically it. If you were to visit sites along the front, it would be difficult looking at the map to know where to start, whereas we know exactly where to start when we look at the Normandy map. We look, we start at the landing beach. This next map indicates battles and dates involving the American expeditionary forces in 1918 during the six months of intense American involvement along the front. Ben will be speaking about the various battles indicated here and the subsequent desire of the American Battle Monuments Commission to memorialize them and to create cemeteries for our war dead there. Maps of 1918 show movement. Still, they require a bit more effort on your part as a traveler, without any clear indication of where to begin. 
In fact, there's no single itinerary to follow, but rather many opportunities in different regions to understand American involvement in the war from different angles in different places, and just as many opportunities to visit significant, powerful, beautiful, and creative work that memorializes the battles shown here. For those watching in replay, the list of sites and topics covered in this presentation are written on a timeline in the descriptive section below. So you can skip ahead at any moment to those that are of specific interest to you. Ben will now take us back to the United States' entrance into the Great War, beginning with this photo of four commanders from 1918. Ben? You know, America joins the war in 1917. April, April 1917 is when the U.S. declares war on Germany, and largely due to unrestricted submarine warfare, and to a lesser extent, the Zimmerman telegram that's in it, where you know there's an exposure of, of Germans basically saying Mexico, hey, join the war on our side, and, and we'll give you back what America took in the 1840s. Um, but Europe's been at war since 1914, and they are they are bled white by 1917. And so there's a lot of view on the side of the allies that, you know, not that the Americans are going to come win the war, but, but that this could be a turning point that, that we can, you know, refresh our armies with fresh troops coming from across the Atlantic. The problem is that when war breaks out, the American army is 127,000 troops. By the end of the war, there's 4 million Americans in uniform, 2 million of whom are in Europe. And so this is a massive increase in the army, which means, you know, it's largely a drafty army with, with no experience. General Pershing is selected to lead uh, what's called the American Expeditionary Forces, which are the troops that are sent to Europe. And he's passed over uh, a number of officers who are senior to him, largely because having commanded the kind of the Mexican expedition uh, that served along the border during the Mexican Civil War, uh, just previous to World War I, he is the only officer who combines two things. One, experience commanding large body of troops, and two, being young enough to actually function in modern war. Most of the other commanders who, who had you know, experience with large bodies of troops are superannuated and, and just not up for the rigors of war. So he's selected to command the AEF. He arrives in Europe, American troops start arriving. The allies are desperate for men, and they want these inexperienced American troops they argue should be broken up and fed into British and French units so that they can learn war from experienced soldiers and make a difference that way. Combine the, the kind of the energy and numbers of the Americans with the experience of the allies. And Pershing is adamantly against that, right? He wants to avoid that at all costs. What he wants is an independent American army that makes its own mark on the war. Uh, there is a, a very symbolic moment when they do arrive, you know, the first Americans arrive you know, march down through Paris, pay their respects to the tomb of Lafayette, and very famously, you know, one of Pershing staff, you can see the full speech, but the, the, the part that makes all the headlines is this Lafayette, we are here, this kind of, you know, this idea that America is returning the debt that the French provided when they helped us in the revolution. Uh, but overall, you know, Pershing does not want to feed his troops into the Allied armies. He wants an independent American army so that they can prove themselves on the battlefield and so that America can have a seat at the table kind of at the peace conference. Um, uh, but, but the other thing that's happened. Wait, I'm just going to stop you just a moment uh, there, Ben, because this was the photo from uh, 1917. And this is a photo when I attended the ceremony at uh, Picpew Cemetery. So it is a, uh, it's, I can't say, well, it is sort of a World War I site, American World War I site, in that Lafayette is buried here. And every year on the 4th of July, there's a changing of there's a, an American flag over the tomb, and the flag is changed every year on the 4th of July. And one can attend this uh, ceremony. There are embassy officials, there's the uh, sons uh, and daughters of the American Revolution are there. There are many different American associations and uh, only limited access is given to the uh, general public, but one can, through connections, um, try to take part. So I think we'll, you know, we'll jump back later in the presentation to talk about what happens during the war, but, but Pershing is important, not just because he commands the AAF, but you know, after the war is over, Pershing is the first chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission. 
And so, you know, after the war, what you have happen is there's kind of two simultaneous things going on, uh, which is one, during the war, all the Americans that die, and there's over 100,000 Americans that die, in essentially, you know, six months of major combat. You know, we joined the war in April 17. The first major American engagement is until May of 18. And the war is over November of 18. So you're talking 100,000 dead in about six months. Uh, although the, some of that dead includes after the war to the to the Spanish flu, uh, but during the war those dead are left you know on the battlefields. They're buried in temporary cemeteries as close as possible to where they fell. And then after the war, there's a question of what to do with these dead. Now the British, and you'll see this as you travel around France, the British leave all of their World War One and World War Two dead where they fell. They're cared for by our counterpart, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and they're spread all across Europe and the world for World War Two. Uh, America decides that they're going to offer a next of kin a choice. And so every next of kin who lost a family member in World War One is offered the choice between, do you want your loved one's remains repatriated to the United States? Or do you want your loved one permanently interred overseas in a military cemetery that will be administered in perpetuity and cared for in perpetuity by the United States government? And about 40% of families choose overseas internment resulting in you know 31,000 American soldiers from World War One who are buried overseas. Uh, and that creates in the creation of eight permanent cemeteries. Right, the this is, so this, sorry, this was the second and first World War uh, ABMC monuments and cemeteries, and this is the first World War. Yeah. Go ahead. And the other thing you have happening immediately after World War One is people start putting up monuments. So Americans who serve start putting up monuments, some before they before their units ship back home. So you start having regiments, divisions, putting up monuments, individual states putting up monuments. And what America you know, wants to avoid is the Gettysburg effect, where there's just you know, an unorganized littering of monuments about the battlefield. We want, we want the monuments that get put in Europe to be worthy of the United States and worthy of those who, did, who died. And so we want to control that and make sure that you know, the monuments they could put up are A, of a scale and beauty worthy of the loss, and C, or B, are cared for forever. That, you know, when this group that put it up passes away, someone is going to maintain that and make sure it stays the way it should forever. And so ABMC is created to run that. Very quickly, they're given the mission of also administering the cemeteries. And so for World War One, you, you end up with the eight cemeteries, 11 monuments, and then... Uh, uh, two additional markers that mark significant events of the war. We're going to start speaking of these specific sites, and uh, you'll be telling um, something about the monuments, but also about the history of the event that led to it uh, as we go through it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep referring to these uh, maps that I got from the uh, ABMC site, and I should say that abmc.gov is the site to go to because it's a tremendous amount of uh, information about uh, about each of these sites, about uh, there are some wonderful videos. I don't know if it was there or on YouTube. Yeah, I can see uh, videos from 1930s of inauguration of different uh, sites. It has educational material for people who are teaching in, in school. So abmc.gov, it's a great uh, resource. And I'm sorry that my expertise stops at the border. I'm sure that Ben's goes far and wide, but mine stops at the border. So we're not going to be talking about the sites in Belgium with all due respect, especially to the Flanders Field uh, Cemetery. So we're going to start with right near Paris, because as I said, the Picpus Cemetery, which is down in the um, in the 12th arrondissement, uh, is, is easy to get to. And these two sites, both undervisited, uh, are very close. This is, uh, we're going to speak about them both, the cemetery and the Lafayette Escargis Memorial. This is just five minutes as the crow flies from the Eiffel Tower here, and this is five miles, and this is about uh, seven miles uh, here. So very easy to get to. And we'll start, which is the logical sort of chronological way, which is with the uh, Lafayette Escargis Memorial. Uh, ben, what can you tell us about this? So uh, to start with, the, the Lafayette Escadrille is not part of the American Army. It is, you know, a unit of Americans who volunteer to serve in the French Air Service and form uh, Escadrille. You know, 
squadron in American. It's, it's a unit, so it's a distinct unit. Uh, about 38 Americans serve in that, and they uh, joined before America has joined the war. These are mostly Americans who, you know, lived in France when the war broke out. Uh, many of them had served previously in other units. Uh, a lot of them come from the Foreign Legion. Some have uh, served in the Ambulance Corps, uh, but they are formed uh, into a flying squadron and serve in the French Air Service until America enters the war. And they're not the only Americans who serve. Uh, very confusingly, um, Americans like to call anything that is associated with France Lafayette. And so we have the Lafayette Escadrille, which is a squadron, which is a distinct unit that served together and fought together under the command of French officers. And then you have the Lafayette Flying Corps, which is just a you know list of all the Americans who served in the French Air Service throughout the French Air Service. And so there's about 200 Americans who serve in the French Air Service as pilots. 38 of those form the Escadrille. Uh, this memorial is created after the war, and it's not created by ABMC. This is not originally one of our monuments. This is created by private donation from uh, largely from the families of the Escadrille, but also from uh, the French public. And it is dedicated in the 1920s uh, and is administered privately. And you see here the memorial. Uh, underneath this is a crypt. And within the crypt are 68 sarcophagi, one for each American flyer who died while serving France. Uh, 51 of those 68 are occupied by bodies, but even if uh, the family chose to have the remains buried elsewhere, they still get a sarcophagi to honor them. There's also a series of beautiful stained glass in the crypt, which you can, uh, on, most, on most days, you can go into the crypt unless it's closed for maintenance or something like that. Uh, but there's stained glass that lines the crypt, uh, depicting the exploits of the escadrille during the war. Uh, this comes into ABC, ABMC control in 2017 and becomes our most recent uh, cemetery. So this is actually the 26th cemetery in our portfolio. Is that a uh, was that a, a a financial question that they couldn't maintain it? Or yeah. It so like I said, you know, one of the concerns with all these memorials uh, is that you know it's really easy to put a memorial and and you know maintain it for the lifetime of the people who build it. But once you start talking about you know a century later, you know maintaining that becomes hard as people die off. And so. You know, this was built by the Lafayette Escadrille Memorial Foundation, which is a private organization and actually does a pretty good job. You know, it, it keeps it going into the 21st century, uh, but they start to have some significant um, maintenance and construction issues and they, they just can't, they don't have the funding. And so ABMC initially steps in in 15 to assist with funding and then we take over uh, administration of the site completely in 17. And I should add that we've also added uh, kind of across the park. Uh, from this memorial, we've added a little visitor center uh, with exhibits that explains the history of the Escadrille in specific, but Americans in French service in general. It is in a park. Uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, French uh, park here uh, that one can really spend. You can get out there in less than an hour uh, out here, and you can spend you know the afternoon walking around if you want, or you can go from there to the next site we're going to visit, which is the Seren American Cemetery. And this is, I was there last week. I don't know, I uh, uh, encourage you to look at the U, my the France Revisited YouTube channel. And I just made a video about the Seren Cemetery saying how sad I was when I went out there. First, I thought it was beautiful because I got to take a picture with no one around. And so often I go to the World War I cemeteries and I can get the, the magnificent photo op because no one's in my picture. And then I think how sad it is that actually no one's in my picture that I'm the only one visiting these. So we're just five miles from uh, uh, Paris. And uh, Ben, what can you tell us about this? This is the, looking from the uh, terrace and this is looking from the in the other direction. Yeah, so, so Ren is unique among our World War I cemeteries in a number of ways. First of all, among the cemeteries in, in France, it is the only cemetery that's not really built, you know, along the battlefields where Americans fought. Uh, you know, Saran American Cemetery is, is in the location it is for really two reasons. Uh, one, there was an American hospital uh, built on, the, on this hill during the war. And so this originally was a temporary cemetery uh, for people who died in the hospital. So most of the deaths here are, are, you know, died of disease or died of wounds after they were evacuated from the battlefield. Um, there's about 1,600 burials at Saran. Um, the other reason it was chosen is because of its, uh, you know, proximity to, to Paris. And so 
to back up, you know, during the war, we established 2,300 temporary cemeteries spread all across Europe, um, some with as few as a dozen burials or two or three burials. Um, after the war, when they're doing the polling of the next of kin, and they get, you know, the number of burials that we're going to have remain overseas, they start to select which sites are going to remain permanent. And they select eight sites. The, the remains that were buried elsewhere that chose overseas burials are concentrated into those eight sites, basically the one that is closest. Uh, but the sites are chosen, you know, based on a, a number of criteria. One is, you know, the beauty of the location, the accessibility to visitors, and then the other major one is the connection to the operations of the American military during the war. Seren is the kind of outlier here, and, and it's the first two that largely dominate the choice of Seren. It is an absolutely gorgeous location. You're overlooking Paris. You can see the Eiffel Tower. And as Gary's pointed out, it's easy to access from Paris, which makes it ideal for having large events and having kind of a place in Paris to mark the American participation in this war. The other unique thing about uh, Seren is if we're looking at this building, uh, when this is first built, only that center structure exists. The two loggias on either side are built after World War II. At the same time that these are being built, 23 uh, unknown dead from World War II are added to the cemetery at Seren, making it the only cemetery uh, that includes dead from World War I and World War II. Uh, and those loggias that I talked about, uh, they have artwork and inscriptions to honor the dead of both those wars, making this a shrine deliberately to both wars. Um, and there's one other exception to the World War One and World War Two at the same cemetery, which we will also talk about today. But we're not there yet. Now, it's my understanding that this site, the reason that it was, the hospital was here and that the France was uh, giving this uh, land for the cemetery was because right above it is this is territory mm -hmm. of the French military here, which is called Mount Valerian. And I'll just back up to this image where if you look close, you're seeing the cemetery and you're seeing this uh, fortress here. And when you visit this cemetery, which, as I say, it's the easiest one to uh, get to uh, from Paris, so I encourage everyone to visit. Uh, and I insist you must also go to the French site, one of the most important French World War II sites, is a five-minute walk away. So it's right nearby it, and there happens to be a very nice restaurant between the two. So you can make it, you know, go in the late morning to the American Cemetery, have lunch, and go to this site. And this site is, as I say, it's a major national World War II site by the French with the uh, the flame of the resistance. And what's interesting about this site, and this was, it was a site, it was chosen this site because this is where the Germans executed military, official military executions. There were summary executions elsewhere, but official military executions uh, took place uh, here of resistance, of hostages, of Jews, of uh, communists. Uh, those were the main people who were being uh, arrested and executed uh, here. And it became, from that, it became a site uh, honoring all resistance and fighting for France. And what's interesting in this site is uh, is the history, the original history, so of the wartime part here, and of the view of the 1960s when it was created of what France, in this case under de Gaulle, wants to show. And what they wanted to show was that France was a country of resistance fighters, which we know was not the case, but but politically, he wanted to show that France is a country of resistors who would never have allowed the uh, Germans to occupy uh, if they, uh, you know, if they had the fighting force at the time. And so it's a political statement and uh, as much as a historical statement. And what's interesting is that I just visited this last week after visiting the cemetery. So I was on a, a, a tour of it, but the tour guide uh, clearly talks about that they clearly talk about the vision of the 1960s compared to the vision today of the war. And it's the same thing when we visit the American cemeteries to try to understand what's the vision when they're creating it and what's the vision now of the country and individually. We're going to return to our map. Breast over here, Ben, what's there a World War I monument doing there? It is, yeah. So this is one of the 11 World War I monuments we build. 
and much like Seren, this is a bit unique among our monuments, and it's the only one that's been built twice. So the Naval Monument at Brest honors, uh, you know, Brest's role in the war, which is one of the largest ports of deep debarkation for Americans arriving. So if 2 million Americans come over to France in World War I, 700,000 of those 2 million come through Brest. Uh, there was also a naval squadron that operated out of there. Um, and so it gets one of our, our naval monuments. And this is the only monument of AVMC that is destroyed in World War II. It's actually, you know, it's damaged by a British bombing raid, and then it is completely blown up by the Germans on July 4th, 1941, uh, which is obviously before America enters the war, uh, certainly during a time of rising tensions between Americans and Ger Germany. Uh, but they argued that they blew it up because the allies, the British were using it as a landmark for the bombers to guide their bombers onto their targets. And so the Germans blow it up. And so after World War II ends, ABMC actually has to rebuild it. Uh, the new one is uh, dedicated in 1958. Uh, and it's actually built on top of a German bunker complex from World War I. Uh, and it is, it is a, you know, a fascinating visit. You can get a beautiful view of the city uh, from the top. What, did the uh, did the original monument look like that? Is it rebuilding yes. it? Yes. Yes, it is uh, a pretty much a one for one replica of the original. Oh, okay. oh. The location is slightly different. They had to move the, lo the location slightly, but the the construction is essentially identical. We're going to return to our map, uh, and now we're going to go up uh, north. We're going to go to the Somme area and to Contigny. And nearby are the cities of Amiens and Saint Quentin, Saint Quentin, which isn't indicated here. Uh, so, as I say, we're going north here. We're going to the Somme and to uh, American Cemetery and to uh, Contigny. Why? Why do all these cemeteries still exist from the First World War if the Second World War came through there? Yeah. So, you know, almost all of the World War One cemeteries fall behind German lines in World War Two. The, the only exceptions being uh, Brookwood which is in England and stays under American control the entire, the entire war. And some of these, you know, these, like I said, these cemeteries are selected, their locations are selected based on their proximity to the battles that America fought in World War I. And by the nature of World War I and World War II, many of those same areas are fought right back over in World War II, this time twice. Once in 1940, as the Germans come through, and then again in 44, 45, as the allies push back. And so, you know, these sites see some significant fighting, and there's a number of battle damage to these sites. We'll, we'll talk about Amar a little bit later. Montsec uh, sees damage. Uh, Montsec actually sees damage from American troops uh, because of its location on on a you know strategic ridge line. Uh, it is used for observers and machine gun nests. And when the Americans come through in '44, uh, there are a number of German machine guns in place in Montsec, and it takes it takes a couple American tank rounds to clear out the Germans. So we have to repair our own damage after the war. Mm -hmm. But there's almost no deliberate damage to the sites outside of Brest. There are a couple incidents of uh, Star of David headstones being defaced, um, but even that's pretty limited. And after it does happen at Meuse Argonne, the, the German uh, commander actually puts a guard on the cemetery to ensure it's, it's not molested anymore. Part of that's diplomatic, right? America's not in the war yet. They don't want to anger America, but but part of it, I, I would argue, is that, you know, even though they were on opposing sides, that, that you know, World War One is such a searing event that, that both sides did recognize the valor of the other side's uh, forces, and that there is some respect between the two. And you'll see it as well with, you know, the French administer a large number of the German cemeteries after the World Wars. Uh, so the sum is always identified, it's not always, it's so identified with the uh, British Commonwealth uh, forces, and there are major uh, monuments, British, Australian, New Zealand, um, um, Canadian monuments related to the uh, sum. Uh, is there much involved, American involvement in this? Uh... Yeah, so this is actually, you know, ties back to where we left off with the story of the war with Pershing, you know, wanting to hold his troops out of combat until he could field an independent American army. And what finally breaks down his insistence on that is while you've got American troops flowing into Europe, the other thing that happens is the, the Russians leave the war. So World War I had always been a two front war for Germany. They had the Western Front against uh, the Belgians, the British and the French. And then they had their Eastern Front against Russia. 
Well, Russia, after the revolution in 1917, leaves, leaves the war. And that allows Germany to free up all of its troops from the Eastern Front and bring them to the Western Front. And the goal of the Germans is to knock the Allies out of the war before American numbers can show up and make a difference. And so they launch what's called the Spring Offensives in spring of 1918, trying to knock the British, specifically they're trying to not eliminate the British Army, and then once the British Army is destroyed, uh, knock the French out. And they initially have significant success. You know, they've got fresh troops from the Eastern Front. Uh, they, they are trying out new tactics, uh, you know, stormtrooper tactics, uh, as they're called, and they start to push back the Allies. And so Pershing relents, and he allows American troops to serve under the British and French commands uh, at the division level. And so you have five Allied divisions that basically fight for the British armies in the Somme region. The first division, 27th, 30th, 33rd, and 80th. And, and it's the dead of those divisions who fought next to our British allies that are represented here at the Somme. This is Contigny, uh, a monument. I wrote the, the words down below, erected by the United States to uh, uh, commemorate the first attack by an American division in the world, in the world war. It's written there, but difficult to see. Uh, on, on the left, a uh, 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 monument to the first division. And on the right, is a monument uh, from 2008, so it's fairly recent. This is all in the same village by Stephen Spears, who those of you who have been to Normandy know his work, especially at uh, Utah Beach, since he did the Naval uh, Monument um, Memorial that's that's there. But why is Contigny uh, so important? Well, it's so important mostly, you know, not for its impact on the conduct of war. It's important uh, because it marks the first time Americans fight uh, as a large unit. You know, there have been Americans who'd saw, seen combat before this. Uh, they're fed in small groups into, into the front lines to learn from our British and French allies. But this is the first attack launched by an American unit. Uh, it's a division attack uh, as claimed on the monument, but really it's a, a regiment reinforced uh, and it is successful in, in you know, capturing Contigny. There's also a special uh, Chicago connection with Contigny in that Robert McCormick, the young publisher of the Chicago Tribune, participated in the Battle of Contigny, eventually rising to the rank of colonel. Upon returning stateside, he renamed his estate Contigny and instructed that it become a public park uh, after his death, now Contigny Park, which also has a first division museum. Contigny is about 20 miles south of Amiens, which is a small city in the Somme that's well worth visiting both for its war history and its overall history and sites. Amiens' major attraction is its Gothic cathedral, one of the most remarkable in France. Inside, there are plaques to the Allied countries that fought in the Somme during the First World War. Among them, this plaque on the left, uh, dedicated to the American 6th Regiment. There's also this angel at the far end of the cathedral that dates from the 17th century, but that became a symbol of the loss and tragedy of war, especially for British soldiers who were numerous in the area, but also for American soldiers and others who would come into the cathedral. There's also a museum in this city dedicated to Jules Verne, um, if you ever come this way. But I especially want to give a shout out here to uh, Louis Tessidou, a historian and high school history teacher who in the past few years has done tremendous research into understanding the building behind him, which is an old hut originally built by the American Red Cross for victims of the war. Uh, after the war, uh, this was moved from elsewhere in Amiens to the site here, which is a uh, former factory, the Cossera, uh textile factory, several miles outside of the city center. Louis is standing here with Philippe uh, de Saint, a business owner in the area who was also very involved in examining and preserving portions of the old factory that's now slated for development. There are two of these former um, American Red Cross huts, one that you see here and one across the street. In re-recording this segment, I'm adding a photo of that building we just saw as it's being worked on to uh, restore it. And uh, here's one of the building across the street, which has been restored. It's a, perhaps a heavy handed restoration, but uh, there you have it. They are listed for preservation and so they must be kept. There will be businesses inside them both.
These aren't necessarily sites to go out of your way for. They're just simple wood constructions. But I note the huts and Louis himself to point out that while Ben is doing his important research as a historian on one side of the ocean, there are people here who were doing magnificent, uh, meticulous research, among them Louis Tessidou. Uh, if in the years to come you hear about an exhibition in Amiens about the American presence in the area during the war, it's probably largely thanks to Louis's work. I'll take you now to Saint-Quentin, or Saint-Quentin, which is about 12 miles south of the Somme American Cemetery and so can be visited on a visit to the area. What I'm showing on this slide is examples of art deco architecture and decorative arts in Saint-Quentin, Saint-Quentin. In the United States, we know of art deco as a style from the 1920s, particularly the mid 1920s and 1930s, without necessarily relating it to historical events. Whereas in France, specifically Northern and Northeastern France, it is clearly related to the reconstruction era that followed the enormous destruction of the war. So when you do visit the American First World War memorials and monuments in France, most of which date from the 1930s and are therefore heavily influenced by the Art Deco style, as Ben will explain in a minute, you should also keep an eye out for Art Deco elements throughout these regions. Another city that was heavily damaged during the war was Rems, the historic capital of the Champagne region, which benefited from funding by two major American philanthropists. In the foreground is the magnificent Art Deco public library funded by Andrew Carnegie. And in the background, you see the towers of the Gothic Cathedral of Rems, whose restoration was funded largely by the Rockefeller Foundation. Now we're going to start going east. And when I'm taking people around, often the place where I would suggest that they go or where I'll take them is to the Chateau Thierry because of major monument and major uh, cemetery and Bella Wood, which Ben is going to tell us about. But first, I don't know what should we talk about first, the monument or the uh, the woods? What what? Uh, yeah, I mean the monument's great. Either one. So maybe maybe about just about the American. Uh, I mean, I, I think Chateau Thierry works because you know it, it connects right. You, that's a pretty Art Deco eagle you've got there. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. So it kind of feeds off. So this is a Chateau Thierry monument, uh, and it is located on, on some high ground about two miles from the village of Chateau Thierry. Uh, kind of overlooking the town. And this is one of the probably, I would say, you know, most iconic of our monuments. Uh, this between this and Montfaucon, probably. Uh, this is designed and, and by. Sorry, but you, you probably, from my picture, I don't know if you can tell how, how tremendous this monument is. It's a huge, huge, huge monument. Yeah. And so what you see on the left there is you, you've got an eagle. Uh, you can't read it on here, but below the eagle is the inscription Time will not dim. The glory of our deeds, which is in many ways the motto of ABMC. And below that, you've got a battle map that depicts the combat that Americans participated in in this region. Uh, and then on the right, you've got these two figures. Those are on the other side, the opposite facade uh, behind this eagle. And, and it's obviously Columbia and Marianne, representative of the Allies, French and France and uh, America, holding hands as they serve together side by side. And so, you know, this is one of our main monuments. It honors the fighting that happens in this region, uh, which is another uh, area where Americans are fed into the line, in this case, the French line, uh, to try and stem the German offensive in the spring of 18, uh, now into the summer of 18, as, as the Germans are, are breaching the Marne River and threatening Paris. And so the second division and third division of the American army are fed in here. Third division to this day, uh, still keeps as its as its name the Rock of the Marne, uh, and we'll talk about Second Division a little bit. But you know, Paul Cray is the architect for this. He's the architect for a number of our other sites. Uh, he's our consulting architect for the World War One program. He's an interesting character as well. He's actually born in France, uh, and then he comes to America in 1903 because essentially the University of Pennsylvania Pennsylvania hires him away uh, to come teach architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and then he, he lives in the America. He still has that job. I think he keeps that job through the 30s. But in August of 1914, he sails back for his annual vacation to go visit France. Uh, August of 1914, 
also a significant moment in history. Uh, so he's in France when World War I breaks out and he joins the French army and serves throughout the war in the French army, he loses most of his hearing uh, during the war. Once the Americans come in, he, he's actually made uh, a liaison to the American army. He's, he serves it sometimes as the interpreter for Pershing. Um, and so after the war, he comes back to America, continues to teach at University of Pennsylvania and ABMC hires him as our consulting architect. Uh, one of the the best strokes of luck that the agency ever had. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of his masterpiece among our stuff. He also does uh, several of other sites. And he's also known, uh, you mentioned the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So he's known to uh, to those, I know there are many people listening who are from uh, the Philadelphia area. Yes, he has work in Philadelphia and uh, Washington, D.C., correct? University yeah, and he also. has a, a number of stuff in D.C. as well. and and. Mm -hmm. uh, the University of Pennsylvania holds his papers, right. uh, which we've we've gone through, and, and you know you can find some really fascinating uh, early sketches of these monuments as he's coming, kind of thinking through ideas, and and you can see it was a change as he talks to the commission and and they finalize these these uh, designs. So in this monument underground uh, here, the uh, ABMC added, I don't know what it was, five, six years ago, a little museum to explain uh, the American entrance into the First World War and the, uh, these, and the importance of the, uh, the Marne, the Second Battle of the Marne. And I think it's a wonderful addition to the uh, monument. I know the space had already existed, but to the museum, because increasingly over time, you know, people, um, visitors do not know, do, no, they know nothing about the First World War. So it's uh, great that the ABMC um, has added that, uh, that part, which should be visited, it's underground. Uh, yeah, I mean, when this was dedicated in 37, you didn't need to explain the war to anyone who would visit this site. In, in the 21st century, you very much need to explain World War I uh, to Americans, certainly. Uh, to France, I think, has a, a, a more visceral memory of it still to this day, but, but still it's fading. I mean, it's been over 100 years now. So Yeah, so I think it's great that the ABMC has been adding these uh, little things to, uh, or big things to, uh, to the memorials to explain uh, what went on uh, right nearby. So uh, whatever the five miles uh, from there is the famous Bella Wood. And tell us about that and about the Marines, how they want to co-opt it as as theirs and theirs alone. Yeah, so so Bella Wood is, in, you know, along with Chateau Terry, where the 3rd Infantry Division fights, Bella Wood is another significant early American combat that is really, you know, in, in many ways similar to Normandy, come, come to live in American popular memory and culture. Uh, and part of it's that because of the, it's the Marines, it's the Fourth Marine Brigade, which is the only Marines who serve in World War One. Uh, that you've got a brigade of Marines that forms half of the Second Division of the Army, and so uh, they are committed to fight and clear Bella Wood uh, of the German defenders. And on June 6, 1918, is when they open that offensive, uh, and this is uh, to try and push back the Germans that have that have crossed the Marne River. They've now been stopped. Uh, and we're trying to push them back. And so the Marines launch a uh, assault on June 6, 1918. It is, you know, for, for almost all of them, their first combat. And they take more casualties in that afternoon than the Marine Corps had taken in its entire previous existence back to 1775. Um, so a, a very searing experience. And then they spend the next month clearing this wood. And so it becomes very closely associated with the Marines. Uh, there are some army units that, that fight here too, but it, it very much uh, has become part of marine lore. And uh, this statue that, that marks the, the wood is in Bella Wood. Bella Wood is now owned by ABMC. It's adjacent to our Ain Marne American Cemetery, uh, which we'll look at in a second. And this monument uh, was not built by ABMC. This monument was built by the Marine Corps uh, because you had in the 50s, one of the Marine Commandant visits Bella Wood and he says, you know, it's a shame that, that you would never know that it was the US Marine Corps that did this. Like, there's nothing here that talks about the Marines specifically. And so the Marine Corps builds this monument and then hands it over to ABMC for administration. Mm. And, and it's, it's a really cool, you know, to walk from the cemetery chapel through the woods, the way the Marines would have advanced and finish here. Uh, and you, there's still remnants of trenches. Uh, the, the monument here is surrounded by some captured German artillery. Mm. Um, so I think one of the, the unique things about our cemeteries is the power of place that they have is how closely they are connected to the ground where this fighting went on. And you know, some of the people buried in our cemeteries 
literally liber liberated the cemeteries that they're buried in. Uh, yeah, so this is the remnant of trench uh, trenches that we're seeing uh, back here. Usually uh, when I'm driving in, I actually drive in through Bella Wood and then go to the cemetery, but it's true, you can go the other way uh, around. And the uh, the wood that we were seeing is right behind the uh, chapel. So uh, what would you like to tell us about the, and we're I, I'm gonna have a picture here uh, later where you can tell about this, but anything particular about the, yeah, so this is Ain Martin American Cemetery. We've got, uh, what do we say, there are almost 2,300 burials here. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I might have the... right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you had on the okay. on the slide. So there's almost 2,300 burials here, uh, representing the fighting, you know, in, in the defense of the Marne River, as well as the the clearing of Bella Wood, and then the beginning of the Ain Marne Offensive. Uh, and so this is built right at the foot of Bella Wood. You've got a gorgeous chapel here. I, I've always loved the artwork at the cemetery is incredible. If, if you visit our sites, one of the things to focus on is not just, you know, the most powerful and iconic part of any of our cemeteries is always the grave plots, those row and row of, of pristine white headstones. Uh, but they're also marked by, you know, beautiful architecture and art that I, that I would argue adds to the power of these sites, you know, we use art to try and convey meaning to the sacrifice represented by the grave plots. And at Amarn, uh, over the chapel doors, uh, some really detailed engravings. You've got a, a figure of a crusader over the door, and he's flanked. The capitals of the columns on either side of the door are figures of doughboys in various scenes from the war. You've got machine gunners, anti-aircraft, and other scenes. And then, as you see here, the chapel walls are engraved with names of the missing, over 1,600 missing from these campaigns. And uh, how about this? Yeah, so that's actually a shell hole from World War II. Uh, Ain Marne, you know, fighting passes through here as the Germans advanced in 1940. Uh, there's actually significant damage. There's, there's, you know, a couple dozen uh, shells and smaller rounds that hit the chapel. Uh, those are all repaired after the war, with the exception of this one shell hole, which is deliberately left as you know, kind of a marker of what happened here in in the 40s. That you know, these embattled shrines were were fought over as well in World War II. And as I say, I don't like uh, the. I I think these are my pictures, but I don't like that uh, when I come to these places. There's no. I mean, it's great for a photo op, but uh, why is no one in my pictures? But I should say that one advantage of having few people around is that uh, you have great access to the staff on these um, sites, so either the superintendent himself, I often uh, get to meet them just because they're in their office and you can knock on their door or their assistant who's there. And there are actually people, I mean, it's 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 very difficult at Normandy. There are, you know, a million people visiting. So you're, they have great staff, but you don't necessarily meet the superintendent when you're there. But in these cases, you can, you can ask questions. They often will spend time. I've had someone, you know, spend like a half an hour explaining, um, explaining why the site is here, uh, you know, the military that was, events that were going on at the time. So they're very accessible um, and willing to speak. So that's one advantage I can say of being them so little visited. This is Chateau Thierry itself, um, which is another example of philanthropy and the American uh, participation and help in it. Uh, this is a couple that was sent by the Methodist Episcopal Church who came to Chateau Thierry and they bought what was a hotel on this site. And this is a rebuilding of the rebuilding. And they built what they called the uh, French American House of Friendship. And now it's the tourist office. So when you do go, you should make that maybe your first stop, go to the tourist office. And upstairs, there's a little museum about uh, Quentin Roosevelt, whom we'll get to uh, shortly. So that's right in the town of uh, Chateau Thierry. Uh, Wazen Cemetery. Yes. Yeah, so Wazen is another of our cemeteries. This one, you know, it's, it's quite close to Amar, so it's easy to do Amar and Chateau Thierry. 18, 18 miles, they wrote. It's 18 miles away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can do all those in a, in a in a day or even you know probably a day if you're going to walk through Bellwood, but half a day if you're not going to walk through Bellwood. And and so uh, a great opportunity to visit a number of sites in a single trip. Um, this this cemetery has the dead largely from the Ain Marne offensive and Wazen offensive as Americans uh, as part of you know the French army start to push the Germans back uh, from their own spring offensives. Uh, you've got 
you know, 6,000 burials here. So it's after these are gone, it's the, the second largest World War One cemetery. Um, and it, I, I personally love the architecture here. The, the memorial building is rife with little details. You've got uh, all these engravings along the top of it of, of uh, all the different division patches. Uh, you've got different unit, um, sorry, branch insignia for you know, infantry, tanks, artillery, JAG, all of the different branches. Uh, and then the buildings on either side, you've got the, the chapel at where the walls of the missing are as well. Um, so it's a very powerful site. It's uh, easy to get to from uh, Chateau Thierry as well. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, Suren. Uh, you said it wasn't the only with uh, World War One, World War Two. Is this the other one you were going to tell us about, or aren't you allowed to tell us about it? I uh, I wouldn't bring it up, but but we we have gotten rid of our policy of denying it. Oh, okay, um, okay. Well, yeah, so, so you you can just tell us briefly about plot. So, not in Wazen Cemetery itself, but across the street behind the superintendent's quarters is a second grave plot, uh, and that is of the uh, dishonorable dead from World War II. So it's World War II dead, those who were convicted and executed for for uh, serious crimes during World War II. Right, like uh, rape and murder, but they were executed by the military. Yes. Right, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, it used to be the policy that uh, there was, uh, you couldn't say it existed, but so I'm glad that you could say it rather than than me. Uh, and it isn't something that one is encouraged to visit, but it is it is there. Quinton Roosevelt, so this is not too far from the uh, cemetery we just visited, the, the uh, Was in uh, Cemetery, is where uh, Quinton Roosevelt, who was the son of uh, the president, former president at this time, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, died in a, uh, he was a pilot who died in a crash. Um, ben, you want to mention anything quickly? Yeah, and, and to clarify, he, you know, he's not, he's not killed in a crash. He, he is shot down. He, he's actually, uh, and he is actually okay. killed before the aircraft. He is, oh, really? he is hit by two bullets. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he, he dies in a, in a dogfight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is at the time, this is behind German lines. And so his body and his aircraft are recovered by the Germans. Uh, they bury him with full honors. Uh, they also, though, take photographs uh, for propaganda reasons um, of, of his dead body and his, and his destroyed plane, uh, which actually backfires because, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is actually widely admired in Germany before the war as one of the gr great Americans. And uh, the German people were, you know, impressed that the son of a former president would fight in the front lines and risk his lives. And, and so it really doesn't work very well for the, for the Germans. But it's also significant because, you know, he's buried where he, where he, he falls. And as I discussed earlier after World War I, there's, there's debate about whether the dead should be returned home, whether they should be buried overseas. And Theodore Roosevelt famously says, you know, let the tree lie where it falls. And he directs that his son's body be left exactly where the Germans buried it, not be moved. And so there's um, a new cross erected over the site. Uh, that memorial fountain, if I'm not mistaken, that memorial fountain is also a Paul Cray work. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, and so he remains at this site until after World War II. Uh, now his brother, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., uh, dies as a general officer in World War II after earning the Medal of Honor on D-Day. About a month later, he, he dies of a heart attack and he's buried at Normandy. and in the 50s, the early 50s, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s widow requests that Quentin Roosevelt's body be moved to Normandy uh, to lay next to his brother. And so this is actually the other uh, World War I, World War II mixing that I was mentioning earlier. Oh, was it the other one? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, is that Quentin Roosevelt is the only World War I soldier buried at a World War II site. He was moved at the request of his family after World War II to lie next to his brother. And to be clear, like ABMC policy is once the next of kin has made a decision about repatriation or burial overseas, that, that decision is irrev irrevocable. Mm -hmm. Once you're buried in an ABMC site, you elect to be buried there, uh, you cannot be returned to the United States if your family changes their mind 20 years later. Likewise, you know, if, if your family elects to have you buried in the States, uh, you cannot then ask to be put into one of our cemeteries. Our cemeteries are closed to new burials with the exception of identified missing in action from the war. Mm -hmm. They make an exception in this case, but they say, you know, we will let you bury him next to 
his brother, but you know, because you already elected to leave him where he fell, like the, the Roosevelt family has to bear the cost of moving his body. So it's the Roosevelt family that actually pays to move the body from here to Normandy. And then once it gets to Normandy, ABMC takes control. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking uh, Omaha Beach, which is right here. And, and one thing to point out on that real quick is you can see on, on Ted Theodore Jr.'s grave, you can see the gold lettering and the, the star shape at the top. That is the special treatment that Medal of Honor headstones get. So most of our headstones are just engraved. Uh, the Medal of Honor winners uh, have gold leaf uh, over all the inscription, and then they have an image of the Medal of Honor on top of the grave. French American Museum at the Chateau de Blancourt, which is just north of the area we've been talking to. And it's interesting, especially about the, for the history of Anne Morgan, who was an American humanitarian and philanthropist who was involved. And you see a, um, an ambulance because she had these sort of... Uh, in the New York, the women of the New York uh, or American elite uh, wealthy uh, were driving uh, ambulances uh, uh, to uh, help support the war cause. She was involved even before Americans arrived and then became very involved afterwards. And this is where she had uh, her headquarters at some point, which is now a museum of uh, about French, in part about her, but about French American relationships, race relations for the past. 250 years. Uh, now we're continuing east and we're heading over to uh, this area of the Muzargan and Samiel. Uh, this is a map you can sort of see, uh, have a, a sense of the Samiel here, of why this is important. And well, why was Samiel important, uh, Ben? Well, so what you have is, you know, by August of 1918, uh, you have this Samuel salient here, which is this area that juts out from the German line. If you see the, the kind of solid red line, mostly a, a kind of coherent front, but you've got the salient that projects forward toward the Allies. Um, and the idea of the Samuel offensive is that, you know, you're going to reduce this salient and try and destroy the Germans that are in it, because anytime you have a salient like that, it, it's exposed and there's a good opportunity to cut off. The troops that are in it and we've we've actually seen this happen a couple of times in the ukraine uh, just in the last year and so that's kind of the idea and the other big important thing about the same hell offensive is if we talked about you know pershing having to go back on his determination of an independent american army feed american troops into the british and french armies to stop this offensive well now by august end of august 1918 he's got enough american troops on the continent that are trained he's stabilized the line enough that they're able to pull the American troops for the most part back out. You know, you still have some divisions that are up fighting with the British, but we have stood up for the first time an American field army, uh, first army that's going to be under American generals, uh, commanding American troops is going to be responsible for the Sammy Hill offensive. So it's the first independent American offensive of the war. And so this monument, is that that's what that's? Yeah, so this is the Montsec monument, uh, and it commemorates the Sammy Hill offensive, specifically you know, the reduction of science. It also has some elements that honors the fighting done uh, in this region at the end of the war by Second Army. Um, you know, it was the other American, you know, participation at the end of the war that isn't the Musargon campaign, which gets, you know, all the attention. Uh, this is, you know, a gorgeous monument. And it also, my opinion, uh, has the most gorgeous battle map of any of our sites from either war. It's got a relief map depicting the Sammy Hill offensive that is incredible and because of its location you can actually look out and see much of the battlefields that are depicted on it yeah i was going to say this is one of my favorite uh of them and if it's slightly reminiscent of the uh jefferson memorial it's because it was made probably a few years before the jefferson memorial it's also uh and i don't know if there's any sort of connection but it's also very similar to the australian world war one memorial in in back in australia oh. it has a very similar design mm. And so not far from there is the Samuel American Center Cemetery with this magnificent eagle. Is this from that period? Do you know? Is this from the 1930s or is this? A yeah, year? it's this is built as part of the original cemetery memorial architecture. Oh. And it's actually a sundial. Oh, it is a sundial. Oh, okay. The shadow, uh, you can't see it from here, but you know, engraved on the top of that base are Roman numerals for the hour. And the, oh. the shadow from the eagle's head tells you what time it is. Hmm. Well, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, this this is like this classically beautiful architecture of the 
of the era. Not too far from here, another American philanthropist and something that one can visit is the village of uh, Aton Chatel, which was uh, a bell singer uh, who was a um, very dedicated to this village. So others became dedicated to very different, lots of different places, but she was very involved in this one village as well as being the president of the American Committee of Village Libéré, they had it in French, but the liberated uh, village. So this was an act, one of these actions of very wealthy Americans contributing to the reconstruction uh, cause, although she started actually during the war. And this village can be visited where she funded a lot uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, reconstruction and bought a chateau there herself. Uh, she actually died in 1928, so she didn't get to enjoy the chateau. Uh, that she bought, but it is a village that's fascinating to visit that's in that same area. Uh, very quickly, just for a time, although one of the most, maybe the most important French, and I should say French and German uh, sites of the war is uh, Verdun. So Verdun is uh, between Samuel and the uh, Mozargon Cemetery that we're going to see. So as a uh, tourist, it's a natural thing to visit, um, to include this on a visit in the, we're in the Meuse area. And so this is the, um, I'll just tell it quickly, Ben, even though I'm sure you know it better than I do, but um, this was a major French battle of uh, 1916, uh, where there were uh, about 300,000 dead in addition to 400,000 wounded. And so inside is the ossuary, meaning that there are the bones of, of 100, uh, what are about 130,000 unknown or just uh, in the basement. You can peer in through windows and just see these piles of bones. And then there are other identified soldiers uh, who are uh, outside. It's a, a magnificent monument that Americans uh, contributed um, heavily to creating this uh, lantern called the Lantern of the Dead and uh, the, the bell that's inside. So it's a major monument. It's a major part of a uh, sort of French tourism, but uh, Americans should include it in their tourism as well. There's a, uh, a very, a, a wonderful museum that explains uh, the importance of, of Verdun and tells about the war in general that's nearby. And then the city of, uh, of Verdun itself has very di different sites because it was a major, major um, site battle um, site for especially for 1916. So it's right between these two American, important American sites. And the next one is the um, Montfaucon Faucon, uh, Monument. Uh, and I'll just say, I'll let you talk about it, uh, Ben, but I just wanna say that there is a, I watched it yesterday. There's a video, a, um, a video piece. They filmed the 1937 inauguration of this and you have Pershing among others speaking at the inauguration. Uh, of it in 1937. So you should look it up. It might be on the ABMC site or find it on YouTube. But so this is a uh, close up. Ben, do you want to tell about the Montfaucon? Yeah, so this is the Montfaucon monument and it is on Montfaucon, uh, right next to the ruins of the village that was there at the start of the war that is completely destroyed by the war um, because of this, you know, the high ground here was key terrain during the war just absolutely shelled by both sides at various points as, as the lines change. Uh, and Pershing, you know, this specifically commemorates the Meuse Argonne Offensive, which is America's portion of the Hundred Days Offensive that ends the war. Uh, you know, and this is a major battle, the, the bloodiest battle in American history. Um, 47 days, 1.2 million Americans participate. There's 120,000 casualties, of whom 26,000 are killed. And that's just the Americans uh, portion. And so Pershing, as both the commander of the AEF that launched this offensive and as the chairman of ABMC, always saw this as kind of the, the most important and most significant of the monuments of the 11 monuments we built. And so it gets the, um, the primary dedication ceremony in 1937 as they're dedicating these sites. And so you have uh, Pershing speak, uh, the French president is there, as is uh, Marshal Falk. And then you have, uh, in a very unique, um, and perhaps the first time this is done, uh, during the dedication speech for this, uh, there is a radio, live radio broadcast by the president of the United States, FDR, back in Washington. It's not recorded and played there. They literally have him speak in Washington and it's broadcast over speakers at Montfaucon, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and so that this is kind of you know one of our 
you know most significant monuments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should, you should definitely look up that uh, that video of the 1937 inauguration. The army was segregated at the time. Um, just quickly, uh, and I mentioned uh, this, uh, Needham Roberts, because he's from my hometown of Trenton, New Jersey. He was one of the first American uh, war heroes that won a, got a Croix de Guerre, so that's a high French honor uh, for actions with uh, Henry Johnson. And, uh, and this is a uh, African-American who, uh, is buried at the Muzargan Cemetery, which we're gonna talk about next. But in a segregated uh, army, how was it possible that they would be buried, not segregated? Yeah, so I mean, a, a couple of things. A, a, you know, the army segregated, African-Americans serve in distinct units. And for the most part in World War One, those are, you know, service units. They form pioneer units that are responsible for labor. They form stevedore units that are responsible for unloading ships as they arrive in Europe. Uh, but there are two, African-American infantry divisions that are formed, the 92nd and 93rd. But even those face significant, you know, pushback against their, their service because it was believed that, you know, African-Americans weren't worthy of frontline service, weren't capable of frontline service. And so, you know, the, 90, the 93rd division, which all of these soldiers are part of, is actually split up and serves at the regimental level under French divisions. It is, uh, the division headquarters is basically vacated uh, and they serve under French command. And, and you know, this photo of, of Roberts here is actually a little inaccurate because they would have been wearing French helmets. And so if you see- right, Well, you know, this was, of, yeah, yeah. This was back in Trenton. He was back home in Trenton. Yeah, this is after the war. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts both earned the Medal of Honor uh, for the same action. Uh, they fight off a, a German raid and kill a number of Germans. Uh, Freddie Stowers, who's the only one of these three who, who dies during the war, uh, is killed. You know, his platoon leader and all the NCOs above him are killed and he ends up going from leading a rifle squad to leading a platoon, uh, crawls up on a German position and, you know, is, is shot to death. Uh, none of these men received the Medal of Honor at the time. Uh, they are awarded the Medal of Honor much later. Uh, Stowers is the first in the 90s. Uh, the Army goes back and reviews records from World War I and World War II, looking for cases where, because of racism, African Americans and other minorities were not awarded the medals they deserve, and so he he is awarded uh, the Medal of Honor uh, at that time. And then Johnson and Roberts are both, you know, awarded the Medal of Honor even later in 2015. But are there uh, so was there any talk that the uh, the cemeteries themselves should be segregated early on? Or yeah. So they... interestingly, you know, Arlington National Cemetery, which has been a, a military cemetery since World War or since the Civil War, still has segregated plots at this time. Uh, there are white plots and there are African American plots. ABMC cemeteries have never had any any segregation. Uh, the dead at ABMC cemeteries are buried uh, without regard to race, without regard to unit, without regard to rank. Uh, you have African Americans buried next to white Americans. You have uh, Jewish soldiers buried next to Christian soldiers. You have general officers buried next to privates. Uh, there is no distinction in where uh, people are buried or how they are honored at our sites. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jewish soldier, soldiers, uh, so there was a, is a Star of David over the uh, tombs of Jewish soldiers, uh, but in the First World War, unlike the Second World War, in the First World War, there are unknown tombs with Stars of David. So what happened to make, to go from a policy of having unknowns to not having unknown yeah, so, Star of David? So we have two types of headstones in our cemeteries. There's a Latin cross, which you see here, and then you have Stars of David. Uh, both made of white marble, uh, Stars of David, you know, backing up during the war as, as the dead are buried, initially they're buried in these temporary cemeteries and often they have makeshift markers. Uh, sometimes it would be a simple slab of wood with the soldier's information. Uh, oftentimes it would be two boards formed into a cross. As the war ends and the dead are being concentrated into uh, larger cemeteries, uh, there's a standardized white painted wood cross. Now the Jewish Welfare Board protests Jewish soldiers being buried under a, under a cross, symbol of another religion. So the War Department uh, puts wooden, white painted wood, Stars of David over the burials of Jewish soldiers in the temporary cemeteries. When Pershing and ABMC are given responsibility for the permanent cemeteries, they push very hard to have the headstones, the permanent headstones that are made of marble, evoke those temporary cemeteries. They believe by this point, even, even though it's only a year or two after the war, uh, that that landscape of white painted wood 
Latin cross, crosses and stars of David has become part of the memorialization of the war. And they do not want to go to the slab style headstone that the army uses at Arlington. And they win that fight. Uh, and so we have the crosses and stars of David. For World War I, we have about 1,600 unknown burials for World War I, and the commission decides that they will mark a percent of those with stars of David equivalent to the percent of Jewish soldiers who served in the army, which is about 2%. And so about two out of every 10 unknown headstones is a star of David for the World War I sites. Oh, two out of every 100, yeah. Oh. Uh, that's why we don't see them in the Second World War. So the, that policy changes for the Second yeah, World War. Yeah, so by the Second World War, uh, obviously, A, you have many, many more unknowns, about 8,000 unknown burials for World War II. Uh, and also by this point, uh, you know, ABMC policy is that if you are a Jewish soldier, you are buried under a Star of David. Any other religion or atheist, you're buried under a Latin cross. By World War II, there's this feeling that the the symbol of, you know, rows and rows of white crosses has transcended religion specifically, Christianity specifically, has become associated in popular culture and popular memory with the remembrance of war dead, that that symbol has become associated with memorialization of war dead, and that it does not have a distinctly religious meaning, which is to say, you know, a Latin cross at an ABMC cemetery does not necessarily mean the person buried there is Christian. A Star of David, by definition, means the soldier buried there is Jewish. And since we don't know the religion of the unknowns, they mark all the World War II unknowns with Latin crosses. This is, I find, the most beautiful. Uh, the, even the photo doesn't do it justice because it makes it look rather flat, but it actually curves around in a kind of amphitheater uh, with one side. And then I'm, I'm taking the picture. I don't know if it's me or the ABMC picture uh, from the other side. What? Uh, so why is this? The, this is the largest uh, Amer first or second world cemetery, is that correct? In Europe. In yes. Europe, right, in Europe. Manila, Manila in uh, for the World War II is bigger, uh, but this is the largest World War I or World War II cemetery in Europe for the for the Americans. Is that in relation to the importance of the, the battle? Was the Muzargan uh, a larger battle for Americans? Or yeah, I mean, when you look at, you know, American participation in World War I, you, you're talking May to November is, like, and by May, I mean the last couple of days, is your major combat that American forces take part of, May to November. Uh, Mews are gone is September 26th to November 11th to the end of the war. And when we're talking, you know, there were 100,000 dead in World War One. A lot of those are disease. The actual battle deaths are about 54,000. 26,000 of those 54,000 happened in the Mews are gone campaign. So mm -hmm. you're talking well over half of your battle deaths occur during this campaign. And so that's why you see this cemetery, not just the biggest, but the biggest by a huge margin, right? The next largest is, is uh, Wazan with 6,000. Mm. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of the beauty of it. I just think it's a beautiful layout uh, in any case. Yeah, and, I, I've always loved Musargan and like all of our cemeteries, what you can really get a feel for from this photo is that, you know, we use art in our cemeteries, but we, we view these cemeteries as works of art themselves, where every element, the grave plots, the headstones, the memorial architecture, the horticulture, all of that is designed very deliberately to work together to give these places a very powerful feel for visitors uh, and very powerful evoke the honor and the sacrifice and the remembrance of those uh, that are buried here. Yeah, that's why I find this is the uh, maybe the most effective of them in just, just that all of, of looking out of out of it and seeing, as I say, you don't really see how the landscape curves here, but it curves. And you, one could say that the Muzargan Cemetery is the farthest uh, uh, afield and the toughest to get to in some sense, but actually there's a lot near it. As I, we already mentioned Mofocon, we mentioned uh, Verdun, which is not too far. In It's in the village of Romagna and in Romagna, the other opposite side of the village is a German cemetery which we're not talking about it here, but it's interesting that there's a, uh, there are Jews, of course, in the German military in the First World War, and that they're recognized by tombs uh, as well. And there's also this wonderful uh, person and this wonderful museum. He is uh, Jean-Paul de Vries, who is from the Netherlands. As a child, he would come here uh, to visit um, with his family, and he began picking up pieces of the war that he found, and he became an enormous collector. And his collection, 80,000 uh, artifacts, all found within three miles of the village. 
And he's someone who he's interested, not almost in the, he's really interested in the individual. He's a fascinating person. I have a video with him on uh, my YouTube, uh, France Revisited YouTube channel. Uh, he'll, he'll just, he still goes out hunting and he finds things, uh, whatever it is uh, here, here. Uh, the uh, ABMC actually gave him a, an old, old flag uh, of theirs. Uh, whatever, anything that relates to the war, he's collected it. It's it's almost like this tremendous, I don't know, junk shop. It is fascinating, and he'll he'll give it he'll give it to her himself to explain it. Um, so it's right, it's just a, a mile or two from the cemetery that should be visited. Uh, just for time reasons, we won't really talk about. It, but Sergeant York, there's Sergeant Sergeant York fans. Uh, he's certainly less known now than um, he was maybe even when, when I was a kid in the 1960s because people were still watching the old movie with uh, Gary Cooper. Uh, but anyway, Sergeant York, uh, his his big success uh, was uh, near, right? That was in the Mozargon, am I correct? Yes. I want to end uh, by talking about the unknown soldier. Uh, ben and I spoke about it briefly just before uh, we started, but uh, I could say that the um, the first site that to uh, World War One site to visit that everyone, uh, I'm sure everyone goes to Paris visits, is the Arc de Triomphe with the tomb of the unknown soldier, the French tomb of the unknown soldier. And uh, Ben, perhaps you can tell us about the American unknown soldier, where he comes from. Yes, yeah, so France. so the tomb of the unknown soldier had their centennial last year. The, the unknown is entombed there on November 11th, 1921, and he is drawn from ABMC sites. So, like I talked about, next of kin had the choice of repatriation of their loved ones remains to the United States or burial overseas. But we had about 1,600 unknowns at the end of the war. You know, as hard as the army worked to identify the dead. You know, the chaos of combat, the destruction of modern weaponry meant that we had, you know, over 4,000 missing and 1,600 remains have been recovered that could be not identified. And so America wanted to bring home a single unknown to represent symbolically all of those unknowns. And, you know, I would argue symbolically all of the fallen. Uh, and they select one set of remains each from four cemeteries uh, chosen to represent the major engagements the army participated in, the military participated in. Ain Marne for Belle Wood and Chateau Thierry, uh, Musergon to represent the Musergon Offensive, Saint Mihiel to represent the Saint Mihiel Offensive, and the Somme to represent the Americans who fought under British command. And those are brought together in, in, in Chalon and uh, in a very elaborate ceremony that ensures that no one knows which casket went from which cemetery. One single one is selected, it's brought to the United States and entombed at Arlington. Uh, and the other three are uh, buried at Musergon. So if you visit Musergon, uh, you can talk to the staff and they can show you the three other unknown burials that participated in that uh, ceremony. Well, there you have it. Ben and I have made a rather quick and I hope stimulating and thought provoking tour of many of the first World War sites in France that are overseen by the American Battle Monuments Commission. My hope is that this presentation has given you an interest not only in knowing more about these memorials, monuments, and cemeteries, but in visiting them and re recommending that your friends visit them. As I said in my introduction to this presentation, the Normandy American Cemetery and Omaha Beach are magnificent sites to pay homage to our war dead, to glimpse a turning point in the Second World War, and to simply enjoy travel in France. But those shouldn't be the only sites we see relative to American intervention overseas. The sites that we've discussed today are also deserving of attention as they represent extremely important steps in the First World War and in the United States developing its place and role in the world through the 20th century and into the 21st. In addition to presenting impressive architecture, art, and landscaping and being located in regions that are well worth exploring for food and wine and art and architecture and all the other reasons we take pleasure in traveling in France. That's my last word. Ben, I'd like to give you the final word in speaking of these sites. Well, I spend a large part of my job trying to bring these sites home to Americans who can't visit them. And I think that's very important and increasingly important as we get you know, further away in time from these wars. Uh, but despite all the effort I put into that, I, you know, I would argue that there's, there's really nothing that can substitute for the emotional impact of, of visiting one of these sites. And the way they're designed, the care that is taken uh, 
with the horticulture, the care that is taken with the headstones, the art uh, in the memorial architecture, all of that, you know, works together. And, and also, you know, many of these places were fought over during the war. People that are buried there died on this ground or within a couple miles of this ground. And that connection, you know, to history and to their deaths is something that as powerful as Arlington National Cemetery is, I, I would argue, you know, nothing can, can kind of replicate the feeling of these cemeteries. And it's worth a visit to, you know, certainly to one. Uh, and I would argue that as beautiful as Normandy is, and as powerful as it is to visit Normandy and stand on a, the bluffs above Omaha Beach among those 10,000 graves, uh, that some of these other sites are more powerful because, you know, Normandy in many, especially if you go in the summer, can feel like a tourist destination. And while I want people to visit these, these are not tourist destinations, they're shrines. Um, and it's worth remembering the people who are there. And that's our mission as an agency is to keep those memories alive. We've done it for a hundred years uh, coming up next year and we're gonna do it for the next hundred years. Um, but we want people to visit as well and, and honor and remember these people. I wouldn't even try to add anything to that other than to thank the American Battle Monuments Commission for the work that they do in France and around the world. And thank you in particular, Ben, for sharing your knowledge and passion and insights with me and the live audience of France Revisited and those who will watch this in replay. Thank you, Ben, and thank you all for attending. This is Gary Lee Kraut saying au revoir until next time. And Ben, if you're ever in Paris, let's get together. Sounds good. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Ben. All right, thanks everyone.